So thanks very much for having me. This is a topic I feel really strongly about. Um, first of all, I want to make it clear that um, um, I actually asked on Twitter, you know, what's the right way to refer to open source projects? And I got like eight different answers. It's such a rich community and so many ways of referring to it. So whether it's FOSS or FLOSS or open source, I'm just going to go with FOSS for now. Um, I just realized that there's there's many ways to refer to this community. So um, I want to start off with the elephant in the room and talk about the fact that why would you ever want to listen to me? You know, I work for the bad guys. You know, I work for proprietary software. I worked at Apple. I worked at Google. Um, but the issue here is I feel like I want to transcend just the economic models of what we're working about here. I'm not here to talk about money or business process. I just want to talk about UX, you know, and where that fits in this role. And I'd like to think that those skill sets possibly transcend, you know, who you work for. And besides, you know, there's to, to kind of crib off of Pablo uh, uh, Picasso, uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. So let's talk about what uh, open source can steal from proprietary software. And the, the goal here is to say, talk about as much of UX that makes sense for open source projects. The reason why I'm here though, is that despite my past, I have been trying very hard to be an open source software. Uh, over the last couple of years, I volunteered on multiple projects. And honestly, it didn't go very well. And it really kind of made me wonder, like, what's going on? Why is it so hard to contribute to open source projects? And so that's what this, you know, me struggling to help FOSS is about figuring out how we can make it better. How can we grow as a community? And so this talk is an exploration. UX is often about having user research. I was a user of research on this project, you know, doing a prototype. This talk is a prototype and then doing a user test. And this talk is your reaction will be, you know, the, uh, the results of this user study. So this is a prototype talk. I'm just trying to see what works. I'm absolutely positive that because I'm not well entrenched in the open source community, I will probably put my foot in my mouth and say something incorrectly. So please, when I make a mistake, uh, please don't assume the worst. Assume that I, my heart is in the right place. And if I do misstep, uh, correct me and let's work together and work on this. So I, I'm trying to help here. Um, the first assumption though, is that um, I'm talking about open source projects that need UX help. Um, there's obviously a wide variety of open source projects and they, not, they don't all need UX help, but things like LibreOffice or GIMP or you know anything that has a very strong consumer facing type of interface is the kind of project that we're talking about here. Um, and like I said before, uh, this is meant to be a discussion. I'm not here to bring you the tablets from the mountain to say you must do this. It's more like, let's, let's see what we can do here to make these projects a little bit better. Uh, the second assumption is that I'm not going to name the names of the projects I had so much trouble with. I don't believe in naming and shaming. I just want to uh, use uh, the examples and see how we can kind of improve those, those specifics. So uh, the, my first try. Um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, roughly, I approached a uh, open source project that looked like it needed some help. And I was a bit frustrated that there was no mention of UX, there are no UX tasks. There was literally nothing for me to do. I, I searched for the issues. And so my first point was uh, there was just no hook. I just didn't know what I could do. So being not wanting to give up, I just posted an issue, you know, just saying, hey, I'm a UX designer. How can I help? And I got a very enthusiastic reply very quickly, which is like, hey, so glad you're here. We need icons. And when I tell, I've told this story now to a couple of UX designers, and I always get a big laugh from them because apparently that's all anyone ever wants on these projects is just icons. It's about the universal ask for any UX designer that approaches any project. And it's like, really? You know, I mean, I'm happy to do icons. Good icons are actually really hard. Um, there's actually a subspecialty of visual design that really does a great job at this, but it's a lot of work. But my point is there's so many more things that UX is about. Icons is like the last on the list. And it's a little bit like if you were a programmer, for example, just to give you some perspective, what if the only thing people talked to you about was unit tests? 
I mean, unit tests are important. I mean, you need to do them. But if that's the only thing that you're asked, it's like, what? there's so much more to talk about. And that's the feeling I'm trying to convey is that icons are fine, but can we broaden the scope of the conversation a little bit? And I'd like to use this idea of icons as my organization tactic for the whole talk, because icons represent, I think, the core issue about UX and FOSS and why it's not working out well. So I have three parts to this talk. Can we expand the definition of what UX is? So there's a little bit more than just icons. Can we talk about the tools that FOSS uses that maybe prevents us talking more about UX? And can we have a little talk about the culture and, and how all three of these overlap so that the only thing that's really possible right now is icons. And the idea is I want to use this talk to say, can we give things a nudge? Can we just push these a little bit so these move a little bit closer together so we have a broader range of things that we can do? So on each of these topics, I'm going to have a summary slide. And the goal is to say, you know, let's talk about what's happening today. And can we push things to be a little bit better tomorrow? And because of my somewhat newness to the FOSS community, um, I may say something that's a little bit too strong. Um, I may not kind of get them right, but let's talk about this line between what we're doing today and what we do tomorrow. So let's talk about what UX is. If there's one word that summarizes the goal of UX to me, if there's one word I want non-UX people to understand, it's perspective. The whole goal of UX and all the tasks that we do is to give teams perspective. What is important? What should we be focusing on? It's, you know, that what do, what do users need? So we focus on these three basic things. Users, who are they? How do we understand them? How do we describe them? What are their tasks? Not what are the features? What are their tasks? What are they trying to do? And then of course, when they actually use your software, what is their pain? Those are the fundamental organizing, motivating type things that UX takes care of. And by doing these, it gives us a lot of vocabulary to discuss. Now I have to quote the cathedral in the bazaar. And I realize it's a very old document and I understand that many of you have moved well past it, but it was kind of the document that kind of established a lot of these founding principles. And this is a quote that I took from it, treating your users as co-developers is your least hassle route for rapid code development and effective debugging. And honestly, whenever a UX person reads this, it's just, we just wanna cry, you know? It is just such a frust frustrating thing about how to, um, uh, about how things work because the, the bottom line, the fundamental thing that has been kind of seared into our souls is that we aren't the typical users. I understand that having developers be the users is the least hassle way, but it's not the most effective route to figure out what your users need. And so it's just this, and I'm not saying that you are not your typical users. I'm saying I'm not the typical user either. And it's kind of one of the most critical things to understand about UX is that while the open source community uses this technique to get people to come in, we need to figure out ways of expanding our way of thinking about that. And I use these four basic structures to talk about what UX is and how we talk about this, understanding, bridging, flowing, and refining. And each of these has tasks that are meant to fill it in. So understanding means to understand the users, user tests, focus groups, surveys, interviews, personas. They're all have almost nothing to do with the product and everything about the users and what they're doing. The bridging is when you try to take that understanding of users and bridge it to the current technology. For example, people that are doing uh, taxes might have a lot of paper tasks, organization tasks, and so forth, as opposed to the actual tax, tax calculations themselves. The software may only worry about a tiny piece of their overall tasks. And it's important to say, well, what can the technology do? What can't the technology do? What will be easy? What will be hard? And that's a very moment of humility for teams because you, are, you would admit that you're not actually solving all of their problems. It's just the, the piece that you can handle. Then the flowing is about basically stitching things together. Um, how do users flow through your product? 
there's a lot of discussion in the design community about uh, UX versus UI. My definition is that UI is snapshots in time, like each individual screen, and UX is about what connects the screens together, the time, uh, as you just flow through it. But th this includes paper mockups, UX mockups, motion studies, and journey maps. And this is the overall journey that your user is taking through it. And then, of course, there's the final step, which is the actual building of the product. Design systems, color themes, animations, copywriting, style guides, and yes, finally, those damn icons. So my point is to say that there is a ton of stuff that UX is doing. And of course, icons at the very, very bottom of the list. And what we're trying to discuss here today is how do we fit these other tasks into open source software? Because all of these things are trying together is to create a shared vocabulary. And so what I'm the summary point I guess I want to leave you with here is that there tends to be, from what I've seen, uh, a, a belief amongst a lot of people in open source that I am the user, the people that are actually developing the product. And what UX is trying to do is to discover the user. UX gathers the right information to prototype and test shared decisions. And that's what I'd like us to do more of. So moving on to my second point, tools. Um, there's the classic uh, American phrase, which I believe translates to Europe quite well, is you know, give a man a hammer and every problem looks like a nail. And of course, the hammer I'm referring to here is Git. Now, a ton's been written about Git. Um, I will admit, I personally despise Git from a UX point of view, but that's not my point. I don't want to criticize Git on the specifics. It's more about what Git is trying to do. Um, all of those things I talked about before, understanding, bridging, flowing, and refining, are all effectively part of this research loop of research, prototyping, discussion, and you generate all sorts of things. Uh, flow diagrams, sticky notes, meeting notes. Uh, you know, so there's, there's a huge social construct that kind of goes around this. And yet, what is the primary tool of open source? It's Git. We are checking in files, right? And it just seems to just block out. I mean, Git is for code. There's no denying that. And it doesn't capture the richness that tends to be what UX is doing. So in a sense, Icons are very understandable. They are the closest UX deliverable to code that we've got. So of course teams want them. I don't criticize teams for wanting icons, I get it. My point is that FOSS right now is only asking for the work that fits their workflow. And my challenge is to how do we expand the workflow a little bit? Now there's one more point I wanna make about tools because I made a second attempt on it with a different team about trying to do something. So I, I, I was able to convince the team that I was working on to do a motion study. Big win. Awesome. I did the motion study, proposed it, checked it into an issue. And the first response I got was, oh, if you're going to do this, I'm going to leave the project and not work on it anymore. And I was a little surprised by that. And I've told this story a few times and I get a big laugh because apparently this type of drama is not uncommon in open source. And, and I don't want to get into online culture and discuss that type of thing. That's a well beyond the scope of my talk. My point is more about the tools and how they impact us because Git issues isn't the same as a team discussion. So much of what we produce in UX requires discussion and team understanding and collaboration. And all I'm saying is that Git issues isn't always the best tool to do that. I hope that's not a controversial statement. I'm just pointing out maybe the obvious point that we need to have a better way for some of coordinating. Um, the, the Newspeak was a, a term I love using from 1984 about a controlled language of simplified grammar and restricted vocabulary designed to limit the individual's ability to think and articulate concepts. Um, and I feel like the, in a sense, a, a text only chat room is a little bit like Newspeak. It basically forces us into this very narrow way of communicating and it limits nuance and social, you know, how we can talk to each other. And so I'm just saying is I just want us to acknowledge the fact that even though we're disparate teams across different time zones and maybe issues is the only way to talk, it has a cost. So my conclusion on this point is that there's this tyranny of ASCII with open source. It's all about text files and text discussion and I understand. I get it. I'm not critical of it. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm a little critical of it, but I'm saying, how do we move beyond that? Because 
UX is about diagrams and discussion and post-it notes. Most companies have war rooms for UX. We put all of your stuff on the wall with post-it notes and comments and people flow through. It's a, it's a vibrant, active social setting. And by having everything up on the walls, you can see it all. Now, I realize that online things, online programs don't necessarily do all of that. I'm just pointing out the culture. And we have a culture in UX of war rooms. How do we get a piece of that into open source? My last point is uh, FOSS culture. And the issue here is again, Cathedral and Bazaar, which is a second point is every good work of software starts by scratching a developer's personal itch. And I get that. And I think an awful lot of projects are really small and you need every maintainer you can. And if they can come in to scratch it, it's good for them. But it creates this kind of bottom up thing that creates, I think, a little bit of tension and it can create a little bit of chaos. And so, it, because it tends to be this culture of a bunch of individuals working together. Uh, too often, I think that a lot of technical people assume that UX designers just want to tell you no. And there's this uh, assumption that we're like these bad guys that just want to shut you down. That's not what we're trying to do. And, and this, this comes from this top down mentality that seems to be anathema to the bottom up of open source. UX designers don't want top down to mean that. What we're talking about is more like UX is like a CFO. You know, um, this is probably a bad analogy for open source. Uh, I, maybe I should be using CFO as an analogy, but the idea is that the CEO knows finance well, but he trusts the CFO to do a lot of finance tasks for him. The CFO does data collection, presents information to the CEO, and then the CEO understands what the CFO is doing and he makes that decision. UX is best done in this model where the UX is in service to the project lead. We do all this data collection, we present a lot of choices, but the product lead actually makes the final decision. But the, but the project lead has to understand UX. That's the point I'm trying to make here is that it works best if both sides understand um, how this works because what you get, of course, when you have this type of situation is, and again, probably to quote someone that maybe doesn't have a lot of traction in open source communities, Steve Jobs, his quote, which I think resonates here is real artists ship. And what we mean, and the, the critical part about real artist ship is that the fact you have to say no. And saying no, I think is one of the critical skills that open source needs because you have such limited resources. You can't do everything, but saying no requires perspective. And that's what we're trying to figure out how to do. And UX is one tool you have to have that vocabulary, to be able to, to make the hard choices, to take your limited resources and get them out the door. So no is only possible if the entire team gets UX. And that's part of my plea here. I don't wanna be the guy on the outside checking in some random thing for your team to talk about and get issues and misunderstand. This has to be a team effort. And this goes beyond a push, you know, you know, a pull request. So in my final point here is to say, I wanna get away from this potential culture of my opinion versus our goals. When we move to a culture of our goals, all the decisions become a lot more transparent, they become a lot more clear, and everybody can kind of support each other and get more done. That's the, my plea here. So here are the three thing, points of my talk, and I wanna leave you with three possible things that you can do. So for, as far as what is UX, and again, this is back in the, the, the sort of spirit of good artists borrow and great artists steal. The first one is to, to, to do a user study. You don't have to do it. Put it in your issues. Put it on the, in your your uh, your GitHub, so that users know. So that anybody who comes, like me, if you say we need a user study, that will be a beacon that will draw people to you. And I'm pretty sure you'll get people to do it for you. Now, there's issues right now with COVID, but I'm thinking more in the future. The team sport. I'm sure your project has a list of things that you need to get done. Put UX priorities on that list. It's a critical part of your document that should be shared with the team, and it'll force you guys to talk and prioritize what three UX things you need to get done this year. That's a great tool to also put on your GitHub to draw people in. And finally, break out of list discussions and discuss this over VC. I understand this can be hard for some teams, especially if you're in large times and differences, but break out of that, have more social interaction, meet face-to-face -face or Zoom, you know, you know, you know, VC to VC, so that you can, you can have stronger bonding and more communication outside of just raw ASCII. I think each of these are small steps that hopefully will nudge your team to get more UX done. 
But keep in mind, I, I'm, I'm wrapping up with my last slide here. I'm just here to start a discussion. My goal here is to kind of give you guys this, I, these suggestions about culture and how we can move it. And I really want to encourage you to go into the chat, the, the backstage room afterwards, and let's talk about this and figure out what our next steps that we can do. So thank you very much. And I really want to thank Toby Langale and uh, Ian Dietrich for helping me on this talk. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, for that. That was really interesting, actually. And um, I hope as um, someone who describes themselves as a FOSS outsider, you fail. Welcome here at FOSS Backstage um, today. Um, we have a question, um, and I would encourage um, anyone else who has them, please write them into the chat or the question tab, and I will um, ask Scott your questions. So the first one is, um, you mentioned that UX culture is also very much Silicon Valley culture. Do you think uh, there is a way to create FOSS UX culture? What might that look like? Um, distributed and uh, consensus oriented decision making, working in the open, volunteer driven, et cetera? Well, I, I hope that today is an example of that culture. I am possibly naively coming in and explaining what I want to have. And I expect that the people that have been this for a long time will say, well, I like that, Scott. I don't like that. Let me know what can we do. Um, and so to me, that is, this is the first step I hope of many. Um, I'm also frankly hoping to find like-minded people. Um, there's obviously a group here called Open Source Design. I'm anxious to talk to them and to see what's going on and to start building up best practices. Uh, and then frankly, showcase successes. Uh, sometimes we just need a couple of design use studies to say, oh, look, here's a team that did it. Let's celebrate them. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that we can have lots of ways and in further conferences like this. To, so for example, I, I've, taught, I've gone to a couple of uh, open source uh, workshops or, or uh, conferences, mm -hmm. and often UX is even listed. So let's just, let's, let's just get people to, use the word UX a few times and see where we go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, that's, yeah, a great plug for the um, <clears throat> uh, UX workshop that's um, taking place at the moment, actually. So if anyone is interested in that, they can head over to the workshop space. Um, that's the UX workshop being um, held by the Open Source Design Collective, and they can help you with um, any questions about UX that you have at the moment. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, yeah, I'll give you a second to write any down. Um, it made me think when you when you were talking about the um, some of the things that you noticed about uh, the way that this design is done. You were talking about the um, the war room, you know, in in this design. You know, putting up sticky notes and and looking at things together and and working on that. Um, I think one of the things that is is quite often uh, takes place in like the the FOSS community is that things are asynchronous. People are working yeah. in different time zones in different places, and so it's 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 quite difficult to um, foster that kind of uh, yes, this war room idea. I mean, do you have any ideas for for how how people can do that? Well, I think step one is to just appreciate that there are things beyond you know text type posts. So, for example, I mentioned I did a motion study. Um, just getting teams to understand that there are US deliverables outside of icons and, um, and you know, just textual lists of features. Um, so, you know, use the tools we have. So it's amazing how much an animated GIF has become the lingua franca for a lot of UX discussion. So start by posting images and animations into issues because, and, 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 and try to get as much as you can within the existing tool. Um, that being said, um, it, let's start with the teams that can do this. In other words, um, it, yes, it may be hard, but can we have a few, you know, VC kind of discussions um, across time zones? Now, if you're completely all over the world, I, I get it, but not all teams are going to be that way. Uh, the other one might be to say, well, can we have some small teams? You know, maybe it's better to take two or three people, put them on, put them together, and they do their own mini worm because two or three people is possible, and then post it up. So that actually, I think, is the hardest question I raised today because and I'm glad you, you called it out because there are no real good virtual war room type software type things. You know, um, what I will say is there are whiteboard, there's whiteboard type software and 
maybe we can talk about having virtual whiteboards to at least get all of our stuff up on a single whiteboard mm -hmm. and then start to do comments. So I'd love to experiment with that. Okay, great. Um, I have a few more questions for you from the audience. Um, so um, your talk about, um, you talk about consensus, uh, where the UX designer and the products lead um, in open source world maintainers lead, um, where they both understand UX. This is hard, it takes time. Is there any suggestions? Uh, it, I completely agree. It is hard and it does take time. Um, just, you know, one of the things I learned as a consultant is to say, you know, what's the cost if you don't do it? And I would argue that if you don't get consensus, it's even harder. So that's the, your alternative. So um, especially given my brief experience with the way conversations unfold in some chat room, in some uh, issues, okay. um, part of the reason why I actually encourage VC conversations is that I think it naturally makes people a little bit more civil. Um, so there is that discussion. So uh, what I would start with though, is, um, you know, community guidelines, you know, how people work, that's becoming much more commonplace um, and a culture that really reinforces it. So when someone crosses that line, uh, we call them out to say, hey, you know, that's not how we work here, you know, um, and, and really start the community guidelines come from the top. And so you have to make sure that the maintainer and the organizers are the ones that say, guys, you know, we're a group, we're doing this together. You know, here's the, the UX documents that we have that establish what we're trying to accomplish. These are our priorities. And, um, but honestly, let's, let's be clear. I think I'm waving my hands a little bit. I think I just know what I want. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure how to get it. And I expect, frankly, that there are people much more accomplished in this than I am. And I'd like to encourage them to come into the conversation as well to say, let's really flag this as a high priority and let's really work on it because I don't have all the answers on this. Okay, cool. Um, we have a time for another couple of quick questions. So um, someone asks, um, is this primarily around applications versus desktop? The desktop has a different socio-political scene than applications. That's interesting because I think of applications as being mobile or desktop. I'm not quite sure I see the dichotomy. I will offer as a counter that I would say it's kind of more end user focused, whether it's because okay. because there's an awful lot of tools that are developer focused that are only for developers, or there's an awful lot of uh, um, open source projects that are like drivers. Well, I don't think there's no there's no necessarily need for discussion at that particular point. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there is there any clarification to make sure I'm answering the question properly? Um... No, I haven't. Because um... I, I would just say is that as long as there's, there's an end user, I don't care whether it's desktop or mobile or web. I, I would, I would, I would put them all in the same category from UX point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, one final question. Um, let me read this. Um, don't you think that UX is just telling people what they should do? It just doesn't fit uh, with send a patch culture. That was kind of my entire point that UX isn't telling people what to do. UX is about culture and teamwork and vocabulary and prioritization. Mm 